<laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's okay to clap. That's right. That's, that's Bible doctrine. That's what we're going to be talking about. So if you can't get excited about it, you're not going to like the next few weeks together. So um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to be going through that. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. If you don't already know, my name is Connor Smith. I'm the pastor here at Temple Baptist Church. Um, and I want to tell you just a little bit about what our mission, in, mission is as a church. We exist here at Temple Baptist to joyfully glorify God as a gospel-centered community that is focused on making disciples and seeking the welfare of our city and our world. And uh, I am proud uh, to be a part of a church that has said that's what we're about. That's what we're aiming toward. Uh, we certainly don't do it perfectly, and there are some of those areas where we, we, we just struggle a lot. And, uh, but by the grace of God, that is who we want to be. And rather than just simply uh, sort of becoming lackadaisical in where we're at, we're saying this is the ideal, this is where we're headed, this is what we're striving toward. And so I am, uh, I'm thankful for the members of our church. And, um, and uh, by the way, it's not too late to jump into the membership class if you're not yet a member of our church or the baptism class. I'll also mention that one more time at the end of the service. Uh, but today we're starting that, and that's going to start right after this service. It's going to be starting at... Uh, so probably right about 11.30. Um, uh, I'll say hello and talk to a few people after the service. And then uh, myself and about nine or 10 people that are already signed up are going to be meeting me over in room B1. And we're going to be doing our baptism and membership class. And so I'm just thrilled at the number of people that have signed up. And uh, we'll just see what the Lord does and what happens. Um, that, uh, that is going to be a five-week-long class. And by the way, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on it uh, because I did talk to a couple of people over the past week. And they're like, well, I'm just not sure that I'm ready to be a member. There is absolutely, this isn't a sales pitch I'm giving you. If anything, it's probably an anti-sales pitch. If anything, by the time you get done with the five weeks, I'm going to be trying to see if I can talk you out of being, not, not really, I want you, we want you, and Christ more than that wants you as part of the holy, uh, we'll, I'm going to use Catholic because it was used there, but we'll get into that here in a few weeks. Uh, and I use Catholic with a lowercase c, I do not mean Roman Catholic, uh, I mean universal. And again, we'll talk more about that in the coming uh, weeks and days and months. Um, but uh, Christ wants you in his church. That's what he died to accomplish, to, to bring you in to the fold. And, uh, and so I'm uh, excited to be able to talk about that. Uh, but at the same time, it is not, when we talk about church membership, I mentioned this last week or the week before, that probably a better word would be partnership. Uh, we're not asking you to join like a Costco club or the Sam's club or a country club. Not that many people in Paris, uh, we, we, we don't know what country clubs are very well. Uh, and that's okay. I'm kind of thankful for that. I'm glad we don't have a lot of country club type Christians in church. Uh, but that idea is very much like I'm going to go and I'm going to pay my dues and you're going to give me a bunch of stuff. And that's the way this, uh, that, that's the way this operation works. That is not the church. <laughs> there are churches that operate that way, uh, but I believe they're moving away from the orthodox, uh, historic, biblical Christian faith. Uh, there, is, there are certainly things that you should expect from a church, but I guarantee you that no church is going to meet that, th those things perfectly. Um, and, but there are also things that the church is going to expect from its partners. That's why it is a partnership. There are things that the church does according to scripture, and there are things that the members are, that they, they do according to scripture. So we, are, it is a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, it is not a very American idea of this hyper individualism. It is very much a communal, uh, community, um, uh, 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 corporate uh, idea where we are, we are together doing the Christian life and trying to obey God's word. And so there is no commitment. And when you come to these and joining, it's just, you can't join without going to these. So it's how you find out about what it really means to partner with us. Um, and I'm sure that in the future, I will do more of a more sermon series through uh, particular books of the Bible where we get this idea of membership from, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I think there was something else I was going to say that I didn't write down, but so the one other thing that I do have written down is our kids' ministry. Can I just say for a second uh, how, how thankful I am uh, for Miss Chelsea Halliburton that was up here a moment ago and all that she's done uh, to make our kids' ministry um, just something that it, that it just was not three years ago. Um, she has put... It, <laughs> just an insane amount uh, of time, uh, her own money uh, and labor and sweat and tears into the children of this church. And I don't mean just to make a program where they're going to go home and go, oh yeah, cool, we danced around for a little bit. No, I mean creating a program where yes, they have fun, but man, more than that, they are being taught the word of God in a way that makes sense to children. They're being taught the gospel. And she's just done such an amazing job and I'm so grateful for her. And uh, But 
Coming back from COVID, it has been really, really hard uh, to kind of get people back. It, I mean, just look around the room. There's not nearly as many seats filled today as there were um, the first Sunday of March in 2020. And, uh, and so there, there are people that are still at home. Uh, that's what I was going to say. I remember it. For all of you that are joining us online, I'm so excited that you're here and that you're watching with us today, especially if you're out of town. But uh, I do want to say this, the live streaming is, requires a ton of work, a ton of effort, <laughs> uh, and live streaming is actually not something we're going to continue doing. Um, it is something that we are going, we are going to continue to post uh, a few days after our service. We'll still post the sermon, uh, but we're not going to live stream our services any longer online starting in August. So at the beginning of August, we're no longer going to be doing that. The reason why is, uh, I mean, the practical reasons are because of all the volunteer time uh, and th that it requires to do something like that. Um, they, I mean, some, and by the way, our volunteers have been amazing that have done it. I mean, at one point they had cameras over here and here and there. They really wanted to try to make it kind of an immersive program. Uh, and now they're like, all right, we just got to set up a phone up here. This is too hard and we don't have the time to do this. It's people working full-time jobs, raising kids, doing all this other stuff. Uh, but the other part is that we believe in the gathered church. We believe what Hebrews tells us, that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, are we, is it possible to say, okay, we're going to try to obey our authorities. We're going to try to love our neighbors in such a way that we will withhold meeting for a time. Sure, but we cannot do that indefinitely and still remain a church. We can't. It's just not possible. You cannot call yourself a part of a church if you are never with the people of the church. Because as we've said for years, the church is not a building. That's true. It is a people. But then if you say, well, I'm also, I'm not only am I not going to go to the building, I'm not going to be with the people. Well, then you're not a part of the church. Um, and so there are, uh, and, and so that, that is, uh, that, that's a big reason. If you have questions about that, I always want you to feel free, feel like you can email me. If I haven't said it in a while, my email address is really simple. Our, our, our web address is just paris.church. I don't have to tell you how to spell it. You already come here for church or you live here. So paris.church. And it's, so C. Smith, so con, as in Connor, C. Smith at paris.church. You can email me anytime. That doesn't go to a secretary. That comes straight to me. I would love to interact with you. I'd love to answer questions. One of the things, and Ms. Hazel can tell you this because I did it to her this week with a text message. A lot of times somebody will shoot me a text. They'll shoot me an email. I'll see it. I'll read it. I'll know I want to respond. I'll forget about it. Uh, and, then I for, and, and then I don't respond. Or then it comes down and Sophia's like, hey, somebody told me they reached out to you and uh, they kind of feel like you're uh, kind of ignoring them. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not ignoring them. I just totally forgot. So you never have to feel like you're bugging me if you end up sending a, a follow-up email or something like that. Uh, it's just one of the areas where I'm still being sanctified by Christ, okay? Um, but coming back to kids ministry then, one of the things that has made this so difficult uh, coming back from COVID is finding the volunteers to do this. But we've started making some adjustments. Um, Chelsea's doing some great work there. And what right now, we only need five more volunteers in order to be, uh, in order to fully reopen all of our kids ministry. Right now, we are only open up to three years old. But we plan to open up. We want to open up our fours and fives class. We want to open up our kids club. So that's first through fifth graders again. We really want to get back to that. Um, we've invested time in, in, in designing a space for the kids and working on a program and purchasing curriculum and all that stuff. And we want it to be great, but we have to have volunteers to do that. And so we need five more just to be able to reopen. But what we really need is about 10 more in order to be exactly where we want to be. And so here, here's the deal. I'm appealing to you today. Um, yes, as your pastor, uh, or as a pastor, if you're not a member of our church, um, but also as a friend. And I'm asking you, um, men and women alike, I'm asking you to pray about this. Um, if you are not already signed up to serve in kids ministry, I know that it is not an easy ministry. Not everybody feels like they're kids people. Um, there is a, and there's a process that we have that we can, we can help see if it's going to be a good fit. And if it's not, we certainly won't, aren't going to force anybody to do it. Um, however, I'm asking everybody to, to pray about um, serving in kids ministry one Sunday a month. I'm not asking you to do it every week in this church. Not asking you to do it every other week. I'm asking you to do it one Sunday a month. And will you pray about that? And then if you are willing at some point to do that, all you have to do, you can send us an email at the church or you can get one of these cards on a Sunday morning that's got the blue strip on the top, turn it around, and inside it says, sign me up to serve. And you check that first box that says Temple Kids. Here's the deal. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. And he also said that that means allow the little children to come to me. Uh, other people were like, nah, that's the, Jesus doesn't have time for the kids. That is not Jesus' mentality toward kids. Okay. The other thing that he said is that if you don't come to God as if you were a child, you don't get to enter the kingdom. Childlike faith. 
Almost half, did you get almost half of all professing Christians today say that they were converted to Christ by the time they were 13? Understand something. At Temple Baptist Church, we don't do babysitting. At Temple Baptist Church, we invest. We invest the gospel into the next generation. That's what we do. That's what Chelsea has spent her time doing. She has not crafted an excellent time to sing silly songs with Larry. She has crafted a time where kids are going to have fun. They're going to learn scripture. They're going to know what the gospel is. They're going to know what it means to follow Christ. Uh, they, they're going to, uh, it, it, it's wonderful. This is not babysitting. What this is, is eternally important kingdom work that honestly is second to none in our church. And when I say that, some of you are like, really? Because sometimes it doesn't seem like that. And you know what? You're right. Myself, our elders, our church, we probably are going to need to sit down and talk through some ways because this is something the Lord's been convicting me about, about how we need to probably do some repenting of how we have not prioritized children's ministry in the way that we ought to. For the abysmal way in which we've acted on this truth up to this point. So here's the, yes, parents ought to be, the, the church's primary responsibility is not to disciple your kids, that's a parent's role. Okay, and we believe that. But the vast majority of parents are not doing this. Of Christian parents are not doing this. So while we will work to equip our parents to be better spiritual mentors to their children, and that's one of our goals in our kids' ministry, in the meantime, we're also going to do our darndest to fulfill our mission of making disciples of the next generation. And so will you pray with us as a church about doing that? And will you pray about maybe how the Lord would have you to get involved? I'm going to take a drink of water here, and then we are going to pray, and we're going to jump into um, the Word and talk about the Apostles' Creed today. Father in heaven, in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 12, it says, you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I'm sorry, Psalm 16. And then Psalm 51 says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lord Jesus, knowing you as a Christian, knowing you is personal, but it's not a private thing. So today, as we come to church and we gather with one another, we bring precious faces with us. We bring names with us. Everybody needs what you alone can give. Everybody needs new mercies. Everybody needs fresh grace. Everybody needs um, transcendent joy. We all have stories of failure. We all have stories of fear. We have burdens. We have weaknesses. We have heartache. We have longings. The details differ from person to person, but our need for the gospel for every person in this room this morning is the same. And thankfully, you welcome us with kindness and tenderness, and gratefully, you intend our hearts to beat with joy. That's why we say week in and week out, we exist to joyfully glorify God, even when we have pain in our bodies or clouds over our heads or we've lost a loved one or we have unknowns about our future. Jesus, your joy is our strength. It's strength for being weak and honest about our condition, strength for repenting when we need to, strength for hoping when we can't develop the hope in and of ourselves, strength for waiting upon you, and above all, strength for adoring you because you alone are worthy, Father, of our affection and our worship. The only sacrifice we cling to is yours. Your it is finished work on our behalf. And so, Lord, we ask with confidence, we ask with expectancy on this Sunday in July, bring us back to the joyful, childlike love we experienced when we first met you. A love that is fueled by the undeserved, unparalleled, unwavering love you have for us. And Lord, it is in the beautiful, powerful, and joy-giving name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen. Well, the title of the message this morning is the title of the series, and it's very simple, I believe. I believe. And we're going to turn to quite a few different passages of Scripture here in just a moment. Uh, I believe the first one is going to be Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter, chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. Um, but as you're, and as you're turning there, and it's going to be a few minutes uh, before you get there, because I, I, I want you to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I'm not sure if I've ever told you the story of how I came to faith in Christ. Um, I'm not sure if I shared that story with our church since I've been the pastor, but I was, it was just about a week or two before my 16th birthday. Um, I had been exposed to the gospel. I'd been exposed to church at various points in my life up till then. And leading up to that time when I was uh, almost 16 years old, I had started attending a church on, by, by myself. Um, there was an older lady at this church down the street that lived in my neighborhood. Actually, she would pick me up and take me to church. And um, 
I was living with my dad and stepmom, who were not believers at the time, and so uh, they, they, they took me to a church, but I had yet to repent and believe the gospel. And so it was actually visiting my mom um, at a church out in northern, here in Northern California, um, where I was again presented with the gospel, and where the Lord just did this work in my heart, and changed my affections, and I wanted to follow him. Um, and I am thankful for the church where I got saved because it, I, I, I did hear the gospel clearly enough to come to Christ. That is something I'm very grateful for. I'm thankful for a clear presentation of the gospel. But at the same time, one of the things that I'm not grateful for about the church, particularly that I was saved in, that I came to faith in, and also kind of churches that were associated in the, in the movement of churches that that one was a part of, is that there was this fear that was instilled in me regarding legalism quickly after um, I became a Christian. This, this idea that I needed to perform a certain way. I had, to, I had to make sure that I did all the right things and didn't do the right things. There was a way to dress, there was things I could listen to, things that I couldn't listen to, and it was kind of hard to keep track of it all. Um, and, that I, and there wasn't this idea that those things necessarily made you a Christian, so it wasn't a works-based salvation, but it was almost like all you need is the grace of God to get saved, but you need a whole lot of works in order to really walk in faith and to be sanctified and for the grace of God to continue to empower you. Um, and that's legalism. Legalism is adding works to salvation, but legalism is also just adding works to God's grace. It's saying that there is anything that can be done for God's grace to be shown upon us, and there isn't. It is simply a gift of God. Um, another thing that I'm not grateful for and in that movement that I was a part of and, and, and really educated on early in my faith was there was really a disconnection from the historic church. Uh, it was almost like Christianity or at least this version of Christianity sort of started in like the 1950s. Um, and they, that, was, that was kind of the, the, the music that they had when they talked about the old paths. It was 1950s music. Not 1800s music, not Reformation music from the 1500s, not the old chants of the first, second, third, fourth centuries. It was, it was just 1950s music and 1950s dress code and these kinds of things. So it was a little bit different. And I didn't know a lot about there being a historic church. I mean, I knew that there had to have been. I mean, they talked about 2,000 years and all that stuff. But to see how Christianity progressed from the time of the ascension of Christ to the 21st century... I was sort of oblivious to it all. Like how many of you have heard of this phrase or something like it? There's no creed but the Bible. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. How many of you have heard, you've either heard that phrase or something like it? Anybody? Okay, one, nobody else. Okay, a couple more. Anybody else? Nobody else has heard that? Okay, great. Well, I'm kind of glad for that. Um, but that is a very common thing in a lot of modern evangelicalism. It has been for quite a few years now, several decades now, this idea there's no book but the Bible and there's no creed but Christ. The thing is, though, when you say that, you're saying a creed. That's your creed. And you know, another interesting thing is that uh, I've yet to look on a church website of someone who says that, uh, makes statements like that, who doesn't have some sort of statement of faith on their church website. Uh, and I've never seen a statement of faith that only quotes scripture. In fact, scripture is usually just kind of put down as a reference in smaller print down below the church's own words. And so it's really just dishonest to say uh, that you have no book but the Bible and no creed but Christ. Since the time of the apostles, believers have been creating creeds that help them summarize what they believe about the Bible. The non-negotiables, if you will. These are the things that you must believe to be a Christian. These are the things of, of what it does or does not what, what does or does not make you a Christian. And that's exactly what the Apostles' Creed was. And when you hear that first word, apostles, you know, we think of the 12 guys that followed Jesus that he called out. And uh, they were great guys, but they were also very flawed guys. And when we hear the term Apostles' Creed, we can kind of get that, this idea, well, the apostles wrote it, right? The apostles gave it to us. That's actually not true. Um, but in a sense, it did come from them still. Here's what I mean. There was this legend that developed around the Apostles' Creed that each of the apostles, before they sort of dispersed and went out to their different areas of the world to evangelize and plant churches, that they all sort of came together to talk about what these non-negotiables would be. And each of the 12 apostles came up with a line, and that's how we got the Apostles' Creed. That didn't really happen, but it's a nice story. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that that happened. And in reality, what we now have is the Apostles' Creed didn't really come to be until about the th second or third century. So still very early on. We're talking like 200-something, 300-something AD. Uh, very, very early on. But there were early variations of this same creed that we do have statements of, uh, we do have evidence of, and that were similar to this, 
as early as the time of the apostles or just after the time of the apostles. So that's a history lesson, but I'm getting to something. Here's what I mean then when I say that it's still kind of true that the Apostles' Creed still came from the Apostles. When we read the New Testament, we find the faith that was handed down from Christ to the Apostles. The faith, as Scripture says, once for all delivered to the saints. There's only one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, that's it. There's not multiple ways, there's not various ways. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. So the, teach, so the apostles' doctrine, Scripture does refer to that phrase, um, was the doctrine that was passed down from Christ to the apostles, those who were taught by Christ himself. And any form of belief that does not agree with the teaching of Christ to the apostles is false. It is, it, it's a religion that cannot save. As Christians, we believe what the apostles believed, and we want to hand that same faith to the next generation. That's our goal as a church. We want to be faithful in taking the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And our, my goal as a pastor is simply to be the next kind of cog in the wheel. It is simply to be the next one on a hopefully a long list until Jesus comes back of pastors that are faithfully taking the word of God, taking the apostles' doctrine, and passing it on to the next generation. So really, my job is really just to get this church ready for its next pastor. That's it. That's my whole job description. But now I'm curious, okay? How many of you grew up or at some point in your life you attended a church that recited either the Apostles' Creed or something similar to it? How many of you? Okay, there's a few. Were any of you raised Catholic? Was anybody raised Catholic that's willing to tell me? Okay, and maybe you recited something similar to it. It may not have been the Apostles' Creed. Maybe it was called the Chalcedonian Creed or the Nicene Creed or something like that. How many of you remember reciting things that sounded something like this? Okay, at least more of you. Great. Now, how many of you kind of miss doing that? How many of you miss the idea of kind of the church reciting something together? Okay, I do. I, it's something that I miss. But I also know that there may be others in the room, and if you're willing to share, you can. How many of you are kind of like, nah, it kind of weirds me out a little bit. It makes me feel like we're Roman Catholic or something. Okay, great. Thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. So you're probably thinking then, those that maybe raised their hands or those that didn't raise their hands, but that's the way your mind is going. You're like, aren't we at Baptist church? Like, is he allowed to do that? Is he allowed to recite creeds and stuff like that? Well, yes, I can, first of all, because I'm the guy behind the pulpit at the moment. I might get in trouble for it, but I'm behind the pulpit right now, so I can. But it's not just a matter of whether or not we can do this. I'm not doing, I'm not teaching this because I think it's, it's nice. I'm not teaching this because I think it's, you know, it's a good thing. It's one good thing amongst many. No, 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 no. The reason I'm walking us through the Apostles' Creed over the next few weeks and months is because I think we 100% absolutely should be reciting this as a church. I think it is vitally important for us to be reciting what we believe as a church together about God and about his word and about the gospel. So you want to know why we're preaching the Apostles' Creed? Let me give you this great illustration by a man named J.I. Packer. Some of you may know that name. I'm sure most of you don't, but he's a guy that I've never met, and I yet have this huge admiration and love for J.I. Packer because he wrote a book called Knowing God. And that book called Knowing God, it led to my dad coming to faith in Christ when he was in Iraq back in 2009, the year I graduated high school. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I, just, I owe him a debt of gratitude. But Packer also wrote a book about the Apostles' Creed, and here's how he opened the book. He said, if you're going to travel cross-country, so just think with me for a moment, okay? If you're going to travel cross-country on foot, you need a map, right? Now, there are different kinds of maps. One sort is the large-scale relief map, which marks all the paths and all the, all the bogs and all, the, all the, the ditches in the road and the crags and so on in detail. And since the walker needs the fullest information about the route that he's chosen, if he's going to walk all the way across the country, he must have a map like that. But for choosing between the various ways he might go, he could well learn more and more quickly from a small-scale map that left out the detailed geography, that didn't have all these tiny little details where you're kind of having to search for what it is you're looking for, that would, help, that would most directly lead him from one place to the other. So he says this, well-prepared walkers have maps of both kinds. And then he says this, if life is a journey, then the million-word-long Holy Bible, that's the large-scale map. That's the definitive, inerrant, infallible, sufficient word of truth. Amen? Amen. That is the large-scale map with everything in it. And the hundred-word Apostles' Creed is kind of like the simplified road map, he says, ignoring much, but enabling you to see at a glance the main points of Christian belief. So here's the deal. 
We obviously can't get the whole Bible into 100 words, can we? Of course not. It's impossible. Which means with something like the Apostles' Creed, you can obviously believe more than what's written here. You can obviously believe a lot more than what's written here. And every Christian I've ever met does believe more than what's written in the Apostles' Creed. In fact, is there a way to just have the creed up on the screen for a second? Uh, it's the same thing that was, was said by all those people a moment ago. That's the beginning of it, and we'll get to the second part here in just a second. And just any time that I'm not talking, just keep that up there. Um, the point here was to put together the essential Christian doctrines and beliefs that summarize the gospel and make up the foundation of our faith. So there's a pastor in Texas named Matt Chandler. He put it this way. He said, creeds do not hold any authority in and of themselves, but rather they point outside of themselves. So listen to me. You can say these words and we don't believe in, we're, we're not magicians at church. You can say the Apostles' Creed all you want. You can chant it, you can recite it, you can whatever. That's not going to do anything for you necessarily. Okay? We, we're, we're, we don't believe in magic in that way. You're not going to say this and it's going to somehow endue you with the Holy Spirit. But, so creeds do not hold any authority in and of themselves, but rather they point outside of themselves to the ultimate authority of the word of God. They can fit, convey the essence, the primaries, the non-negotiables. They convey the essence of what we confess and what we believe as the body of Christ. Or as another preacher put it, all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, but none can believe less. We're, that's what we're saying. That's what a creed or a statement of faith that a church puts out. That's what that is. We're saying you cannot believe less than this and be a member of our church. Or in the case of the Apostles' Creed, you cannot believe less than this and be a Christian. So if you don't believe at least this, it should be difficult for you to think of yourself and for other believers to think of you as a Christian. But here's what I find really interesting. I'm not sure if you noticed, but the Apostles' Creed has a whole lot of really kind of facts, right? God the Father, He's the creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's just a bunch of facts about the Father, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about things that we believe. The Apostles' Creed does not tell us to do anything. It just tells us who God is and what God's done. The only verb or action or response on the part of the one reading the creed or reciting the Apostles' Creed is the very first phrase, I believe. That's it. That's the only verb in there. But what does that mean exactly? How is that, belie how is that belief to be manifested in the life of our church? How is that belief to be manifested in the life of individual Christians? And here's where the problem comes in. When you think of the words, I believe in English, what happens is we kind of have this idea in our mind where we affirm something to be true. I believe that back wall is made out of glass. That is... True. I believe I am wearing Vans this morning. That is a fact. Okay? At least as far as I know. So, you get the idea that in your mind that you're affirming something to be true. So if someone were to say, I believe in God, should we then automatically understand them to be a Christian? The answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no. Just because somebody says, I believe in God, doesn't mean we understand them to be a Christian. It doesn't even mean they think they're a Christian. So we should not do that because our English word for believe is kind of this very puny, weak word that doesn't have a whole lot of teeth behind it. It's kind of like saying, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, that, that seems right. And we obviously need to do, we need to at least have this opinion of God, right? We need to at least have this. You can't be a Christian without this, but you need more than this to be a Christian. If we don't think God even exists, then we obviously can't go any further. But is that all that Christianity is? Is, is Christianity simply an affirmation that God exists? Of course not. I know lots of people who aren't Christians and who would never even call themselves Christians who would say, I think God exists, there's a professor at Oxford University in England named uh, uh, Alistair McGrath. And he said, I believe in God has roughly the same status as I believe in fairies. For them, faith is just assent to a list of propositions. There's nothing more to Christian belief than running through a checklist, a checklist of propositions such as those contained in the creed itself. But this is definitely not how the Bible uses that word believe. And here's where we're going to spend a good portion of our time this morning. And I want you to have your Bibles open because we're going to be turning all over the place. And I told you Matthew's where we're going to start. We're not going to start in Matthew. We're going to start in Romans. We're starting in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4.
And I'm going to have to be turning a lot too, so just bear with me. Romans chapter 4, we're talking about Abraham here for a second. We're going to sort of bounce around, but let's start in verse number 1. What then will we say uh, that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified, you could think of that as coming to faith or being saved. If Abraham was saved by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Well, it tells us this in, in, in verse 3. Abraham what? I'm sorry, Abraham what? One more time, Abraham what? I'm going to ask for a lot of involvement over the next few weeks. If you're not going to like it, again, you're not going to like the sermon series. I'm going to need your help, okay? I didn't put all this work in uh, for us to just kind of, we're not consumers, right? That's not what we're here to do. We're here to participate and partner together in the work of the gospel ministry. So I need some help. So Abraham did what? Believe. Believe. Thank you. God, he believed God and it was credited. I'm not sure which version. I don't know. They all say the same thing here. So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. It was added to his account. I want you to jump down to verse 11. Then what happens? Well, then he received the sign of circumcision. Galatians lets us know that it's not a perfect translation. Baptism is not exactly what circum... Baptism in the New Testament is not exactly what circumcision was in the Old Testament, but they are related. And so it says he received the sign of the circumcision as a seal of the righteousness. So the circumcision isn't what saved him, but it was the way that he understood himself to be part of God. It was the way he, others understood him to be part of this covenant community. So he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. And what led to that? Abraham did what? Believed. He believed. And then God considered him righteous. Now I want you to turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Real famous passage of scripture. Hebrews chapter 11. Again, we're not going to read the whole thing. I just want to bounce around here for a second. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. Now faith, another word for belief, or you could say it's belief kind of on steroids a little bit. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, and it is the proof of what is not seen. So belief, when it is rightly understood, is better than reality. Belief, when it is rightly understood, can be understood to be proof of something. Faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Verse 2, for by it our ancestors won God's approval. And then he just goes in, whoever the author of Hebrews is, goes into this long list of story after story after story after story in the Old Testament of these men and women who believed God and God used them to do some really amazing things or he worked in their lives in some really amazing ways. And we don't have time to go through all of it, but just look at verse six. So without faith, without belief in God, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists, but not just that, and that he rewards those who seek him because of that belief. Jump down to verse 32. And lots of stories, but then what does he do at the end when he gets done all those stories? He goes, and what more can I say? Time's too short for me to tell about all the other ones, Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And then he goes into this awesome list. Who by faith, so because of their belief in God, I want you to notice this, verse 33. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging uh, of fire, uh, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign, foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were sawed in half and it wasn't a magic trick. They were being killed. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not even worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Verse 39, and all these were approved through their faith. That's why they did it. Because faith was as good as proof. Faith and belief in God was as good as reality. Now turn to Mark with me. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. 
Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. Amazing story of, uh, of Jesus here. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. So what happens? Verse 27, she heard about Jesus. So having heard about Jesus, what does she do? Well, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched. So that heard, for her to hear about Jesus and think that if I touch him, something's going to happen, it meant that she had to believe that it could happen, right? And not just believe in the sense that I understand that wall to be made of glass, belief to the point that it made her go up and knock on the glass. It made her go up and see. It put her faith to the test. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing, for she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And what does he say to her? Daughter, your faith. Your what? Faith. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. Belief led to action, led to salvation. Belief rightly understood led to action, and Jesus called this faith. Turn to Matthew now. A couple, couple books back, if you know where that is. It's the first book of your New Testament. Matthew chapter number nine. And if you're not able to hear me because you're not turning fast enough because I'm going too fast and I have that tendency to do that, it's okay to just listen as well. Uh, Matthew chapter nine, verse 27. He tells that same story again in the verses right before that of that woman. But then in verse 27, he says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men approached him and Jesus said to them, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, guys. Do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I can do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. What did that belief lead to? He touched their eyes, saying, let it be done for you. How? According to your faith. According to your belief. It was as good as done. Let's turn to the book of James, further back in the, in the New Testament now. James, chapter number two. James, chapter number two. We're going to look at verse 14. And he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith? See, this is what we think of when we think of I believe in God. It's just a claim. It's just an agreement with a proposition, right? So what is it? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Then he asks a question. Can such faith save him? Rhetorical question. No, it cannot. So if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to him, well, go in peace. Stay warm, brother. Stay warm, sister. Be well fed. I see that I can see your ribs and that you're hungry and you haven't eaten in weeks. Be well fed, brother. God be with you. God bless. You don't give him what the body needs? What good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. If it doesn't lead you to do something, if it doesn't lead you to follow someone, rather, it's dead. So, but someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. And he says very clearly, show me your faith without your works. See if anybody believes it. They won't. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe that. They shudder. Belief is not a, an affirmation of a proposition. And then he goes in verse 20, you senseless person, you fool, you idiot. You're dumb. Stop it. You senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works and offering Isaac, his son, on the altar? And he says this in verse 22, you see that faith was active. Faith was active together with his works. And by works, faith was made complete. And then he says the same thing that was said earlier. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Last one, go to Acts. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we're going to look at verse number 30 together. 
This is a story of the Philippian jailer. You may not know that story, but what happens is you've got Paul and Silas and they're in jail. God sends an earthquake. The jail breaks. Paul and Silas are able to escape, but there's a guard that had been, that had been assigned to watch over them. And what happens is the guard then realizes that they're going to be able to escape. And so he gets ready to put the sword through him. He's basically going to commit suicide because he's so ashamed of himself, even knowing he's going to believe, uh, leave behind a wife and a family at home, as we'll find out in a moment. But then Paul and Silas go and stop him and, and they, they try to talk to him for a minute. And then what does he say in verse 30? He escorts them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? What did they say? Believe. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you might be saved? No. You shall. You will be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. And so then he brought them into his house. He set a meal before them. And what did that lead to? It led to rejoicing. Why? Because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Belief led to action, led to salvation, led to joy. Here's the deal. This is one of the problems we run across when translating these ancient languages into into English. Some of you may know about the the Greek word for love. There's multiple different ways of saying it. There's agape love, which is this just deep, overwhelming, overarching love. There's a phileo love. It's like a brotherly love. Philadelphia is named after that word. You've got eros love. That's an erotic love between intimate partners. It's that idea. Uh, So you have these different kinds of love that we find in scripture. uh, And we only have one word for all of that, and it's love. That's why we can say, "I, I love pizza and I love, you know, going to my bedroom with my wife. Those are two very different things, and yet we use the same word to describe it. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't really work out well. So the idea that most who put the creed together had in mind was something way more meaningful than just what we think of when we say believe. It was more like, I have confidence in this. I have confidence in God. I put my trust in God. Some of you can stop whispering when I said that, okay? I know. We, well, I said, I said something a little risque from the pulpit, and everyone's <laughs> You that yeah. I'm seeing husbands and wives give each other elbows. So let's calm down. That same Oxford professor said this. He said, when I declare that I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm not just saying that there once was a man called Jesus. No, 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 no. I'm affirming my trust in him. And here's the deal with that. Faith cannot be equated with simply knowing facts. It is not a cold and cerebral idea enlightening the mind while leaving the heart untouched. Faith is the response of our whole person to the person of God. It is our joyful reaction to the overwhelming divine love that we see revealed in Jesus Christ. It is the simple response of leaving everything to follow Jesus. Faith is both our recognition that something wonderful has happened through the, de- through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus And it is our response to what has happened. Faith realizes that God loves us and then it responds to that love. With no response, there's no salvation. Faith is saying yes to God. It's a decision. It's an act of will to trust God or to to say it in one sentence. uh, Christian faith or belief means hearing, taking note of, and doing what God says. Christian faith or belief means hearing, noting and doing what God says. This is why I'm spending an entire sermon just talking about these first two words. I believe, rightly understood, should lead to active, saving faith. And that's all well and good. It's great to know what I believe means, but there's still a problem if all I did is define a word for you. There's still a problem if that hugely important belief is misplaced. So now we've got to talk about what is it that we believe in. And I'm just going to give a quick survey, and then this is what we're going to be getting into over the course of the next several weeks. Because in the original language of the creed, there are three main sections. Here's where I want to be able to look at this together. They each start with, I believe. Now, that's not how it was translated into English ever, but the way it is, so where it says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, then when it comes down to Jesus Christ, in the original Latin that we have the oldest manuscripts of the Apostles' Creed in, it starts with Jesus Christ, another, I believe. And then go to the next slide for the Apostles' Creed. Then when you come down to, I believe in the Holy Spirit, right there in the middle of the screen, there it says, and it says it there. So there are three I believe statements. I believe God the Father. I believe Christ the Lord. I believe Holy Spirit, right? 
And then within that foundation, you find within all of that, these awe-inspiring, life-giving, precious, and fundamental truths of the word of God, like the Trinity, like the creation, like the fact that Jesus became a man. We call that the incarnation, like the Holy Spirit, like the doctrine of the church, like the forgiveness of sins, like the hope of what Christians are, the fact that we have hope that we are not going to be just worm food next door. We have hope that we're not going to be judged for our sins if we're in Christ, if we truly believe this in the true sense of the word, because we see that, uh, go to the next screen again. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And what happens if our sins have been forgiven? I believe in the resurrection of the body that Wren and that Ray and that Virginia and that Pete and that my, that, that, that the people that I love and the people that we love that we've lost to death tragically way too soon, way sooner than we hoped or thought we would because they believed this, their bodies are resurrecting. It's not going to be some uh, spiritual thing. There's going to be some ghost walking around. No, 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 no. Everything's going to be restored and we're going to have everlasting life and we can have hope in that because of what Christ has done, because he resurrected. That's why this is so important. And that's the hope that is found within the creed. This is why it's so important for us to talk about these things. So for hundreds of years, our spiritual forefathers, our brothers and sisters in the faith for almost the past 2000 years have recited this creed in church. Yes, but also it was the way that the vast majority of people were introduced to the Christian faith. This is really what was given to people and explained to people to bring them into the faith for them to become Christians. This was the ABCs of Christianity before there was such a thing. And it was a whole lot more robust than the ABCs of Christianity. So when someone wanted to become a Christian and claim that they were turning from their sin and turning to Christ, the church would come alongside of them and walk them through this creed so that when they got baptized and were understood to be Christians by this community of believers, they could do so knowing exactly what they were walking into. So when they got baptized, they were declaring personally, yes, but also publicly that they believed in and were committed to this historic Orthodox Christian faith, the gospel. They weren't just rattling off some facts about who Jesus was. They were telling themselves, they were telling the church, and they were telling the world, I have turned from my sin, and I have placed my trust fully and completely in the God, in God the Father, in God the Son, in God the Holy Spirit, and all that is taught about this triune God in the scriptures. And this is why the Apostles' Creed will be taught from here, from here on out in every single baptism class we give at Temple Baptist Church, every single new member class. Now, that's not some new or Roman Catholic sort of thing. It's just been basic Christianity 101 for almost 2,000 years. And I want to make sure that not just our new members and new converts know this, but that our entire congregation is on the same page. And it's why I'm teaching this series. But here's where the massive problem we have in modern Christianity becomes so painfully obvious. There's this huge divide between ancient Christian faith and modern Christian faith in a lot of ways. See, one of the problems that we have is that today in many of our evangelical churches, we've gotten away from what was considered foundational Christian truth when we preach the gospel. We've gotten away from things like the Trinity. I've never seen that on a gospel tract. I've never seen the doctrine of the church there. I've never seen living a life that's holy and set apart for God there. No, we've gotten into this ABC of Christianity. This is literally a published thing. All have, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so believe in Jesus Christ and confess that you're a sinner. You want to pray that with me right now? One, two, three, repeat after me. I'll say these words. You say these words. You said those words. Excellent. Shake my hand. Here's a Bible. Write this date down. You're a Christian. Hope to see you in church Sunday. We'll talk about baptism later. It became a sales pitch. Or we've gotten the Romans road. I'll just share these five verses with you at the door and ask you to commit your entire life and the rest of your, your eternity to a God you don't know yet. One, two, three, repeat after me, versions of Christianity the Bible knows nothing about. J.I. Packer summed up our very 21st century problem again this way. He said, as 20th century trains and cars came to be streamlined for speed, that's what happened with the gospel. So the gospel was streamlined for instant comprehension, instant response. The question being explored was, how little do we need to tell people for them to be Christians? How tragic. How tragic that we would think we need to dumb God down for people to want him. We need to dumb down the glorious truths in his word for people to want him. 
And here's where we get to the problem of divorcing the Trinity and the importance of a local church and things like that from the gospel. This truncated version of the gospel message presenting Christ the Redeemer apart from God the Creator, apart from the remission of sins, apart from personal regeneration, individual salvation apart from life and worship in the church with your brothers and sisters, and the hope of heaven apart from living this pilgrim path of holiness which is what in practice the ABC approach does, it becomes a misrepresentation of the true biblical gospel. And it's caused all kinds of problems in the church. And for pastors, for instance, in the majority of churches, at best, the pews are filled with very weak, uninformed Christians. And at worst, there are many who are warming a seat each week who think of themselves as Christians who are not. And you know this is a problem when you've got a lot of Christians who see something like the Apostles' Creed and they don't think it looks or sounds very Christian. Because I got 1,900 plus years of church history to show you that pretty much all of our spiritual forefathers understood this to be Christian. And so with all that being said, let me try to bring this home real quickly, okay? Here's the deal. As a church, our mission statement is this. And it begins this way. We exist to... How how are we going to glorify God? We exist to joyfully. One more time. We exist to joyfully glorify God. And obviously people can be saved without knowing one word of the Apostles' Creed. Let Let me make that clear. People have been. I was. Many of you were. If not all of you, you can be saved apart from the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please hear that abundantly clearly this morning. You can be saved with just some very basic truths. That's why young children coming to Christ is so precious. I don't want to minimize that. But here's how one theologian put it. We are not beggars just hoping for scraps from the table. (laughs) We are like people who have inherited a vast estate. So we have to study the documents and visit different locations because it's more than we can take in at a single glance. In the same way, it takes considerable time and effort to begin to comprehend all that we've received in Christ. I mean, that's why it's so wonderful to talk to older Christians that have been around for a while. Because they'll tell you, I, I love hearing that. when they've re- These are people that read their Bible so faithfully day in and day out. And don't just read it to say they read it and check off a box, but they, they meditate on it. They chew on it. They recite it. They memorize it. And you talk to these people that have been doing that for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and they go, man, it is amazing how I continually learn new things about God and who he is and his love for his people. So in the same way, it takes considerable time and effort to comprehend all that we've received in Christ. Theological thinking does not add a single thing to what we've received. The inheritance remains the same whether we grasp its magnitude or we don't. But here's the deal. The better we grasp it, he he ends with this, the happier we are, the more joyful we are. That's the way marriage is supposed to be, right? You don't, and and I don't know anybody that would say, I don't got to tell her I love her. I did it once at the altar. I don't got to do it again, do I? I don't need to learn anything about what she likes to eat or what she likes to wear, where she likes to go. It's not all that important. I mean, we got married. We said I do. So can you technically be married and have that be the case? Yep. Can you technically be married and never go home to your wife or your husband? Technically, sure. Is it going to be a good marriage? Is it going to be a happy marriage? Is it going to be a joyful marriage? No. No. So it always blows my mind when people are like, you don't need doctrine. I don't need any books but the Bible. I don't even know anything else about God. What are you talking about? This is the creator of the universe who died to save our souls from the fires of hell and to give us all the glories of heaven, although we are completely and totally undeserving and we say we don't need to know anything else about him. At the heart of why your pastor is preaching this series to you is joy. It's joy. And there is no greater joy than to know Christ as your Savior. Regardless of what the age difference is between those in this room uh, to me, as, as a pastor, I view those in my flock in one way or another as children. Although many of you have been spiritual mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, all of you, in a sense, are children in a, in, in a way that's at least a love that I feel. And 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in truth and they continue to walk in that truth and grow in that truth and not say, I'm fine with where I'm at. I don't need to go any further than this. 
I want our people to be so aware of who God is and his entirety and what he's done. And I believe that more, the more we know, the more our hearts will be propelled toward joy and our bodies toward his joyful service. But in the end, as one pastor said, belief is a decision of the will. So when I became a Christian, I chose to believe in God and whatever he wanted for my life. Regardless of how you understand election, there is still the responsibility of man. And I chose to believe in God and whatever he wanted for my life. And that has been something that I've had to choose to do every day since then as well. And that belief has caused me to say yes to certain things and no to certain things because that's what biblical belief does. But can I tell you my fear? And then I'll be done. And we're going to stand and we're going to say these words together. My fear is summed up well, again, by that guy from Oxford. He went to Oxford, so I, I like quoting him. The guy from Oxford, once again, he summed it up nicely and he said this, a surprisingly large number of people who think of themselves as Christians never get further than simply accepting the truth of Christianity as a fact. They believe that God is there. They've never met him. They believe that God is able to forgive sins, but God's never actually forgiven their sins. They believe that God is reliable, but they've never relied on him. They're on their way to faith, but they have yet to arrive. For such people, I believe in God can mean little more than I think there may be a God somewhere. But the richness and depth of the gospel remains unknown to them. And so I'm curious, and nobody should answer this, but meditate upon it in your hearts. Do you see yourself in that description? Is that you? Imagine there was a cure for a terminal illness. And there's been a cure developed for this disease. You've been diagnosed with this illness. You know that there's a cure for it. You believe that the cure works. You believe that it can actually do what the doctors are saying it can do. It will heal you. You believe that on paper. You could sign it and say, yep, absolutely, that, that vaccine or that whatever, that treatment, that would absolutely heal me. But you don't receive the vaccine. It's not rocket science to understand that you're still going to die from that disease. And that belief then has absolutely no power to save you. And that's the way it is with the gospel. Believing it can change your life. And believing that it can change your life is one thing, but allowing it to do just that is something else. So can we stand together at this time? I want to recite this creed. Go back to the first side of it. And we're going to be doing this every week for a while. Um, I hope that you'll join me in doing it. I hope that maybe you'll take some time to, to memorize it on your own, as I've done the, the last few months. We're going to say it together, and you can follow my lead. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Stay, stay standing for just a moment because we're just going to pray and then we're going to sing. But if today you believe that, and I mean really believe that as we've talked about in Scripture, and perhaps believe it for the first time, there's nothing better you could do than be baptized. There's nothing better you could do than to say yes to God, turn from your sin, declare it privately and publicly in baptism, and that we're, we're starting that process of getting you ready for that today, right after the service. If you can't make it today, but that's something you're interested in, talk to me. Please, well, I have a couple of other pastors that are here at the front. We would love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian and to follow Christ and to turn from sin and to experience all the joy of what it means to, to follow the Savior. You can email me this week if you've got questions and don't want to stay today or you're not able to make it to the class or you can just walk over and come into the class with me. I'll print off some more materials for you. But there's nothing better you could do than, than to repent, believe, be baptized. And I'll be right here at the front if you have questions, if you'd like to talk or pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. We love you, Lord. And I, I love you, and I'm so grateful for 
Christians that have gone before us. Lord, I'm thankful for some of the older saints in this room, the brothers and sisters that have lived a lot more life than me and have been able to taste and see that the Lord is good for a lot longer and in a lot more in a lot deeper ways than I've had yet to experience. And I pray that just as I would encourage our church to look to these more seasoned saints and to learn from them and to learn about God from their testimony and their stories and learn about who he is and how his faithfulness has worked and operated in their lives. In the same way, I would say that as I believe in the communion of saints, that is saints not just today, that is saints past, present, and future. That is all those who have ever been, who are currently or ever will be in Christ. And Lord, we believe that. And if we believe in the communion of saints, and let us look back to these brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers in the faith, who have tasted, they have seen, they have tested and tried their faith and it has come out pure as gold. It has been refined in fire and it has come out on the other side, exactly as you intended. Lord, I pray that we would learn from this ancient faith, not man-made traditions, Lord, an ancient faith that is rooted in scripture, that is rooted in the gospel and all that that means and that we would respond to it in faith. Those that never have before, I pray today would be the day that they would do that. They would repent, believe, and soon would be baptized. For those that have already been, that are, that are Christians, they, they have already believe in this real, genuine, biblical, Christ-centered way. God, would you help us to realize that it is not a one-time thing. It is a, it is a daily choice to believe. You daily imbue us with grace guide us, direct us. That is why we say that third, I believe. I don't just believe in God the Father. I don't believe just believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit who is fully God. And that he fills us and he indwells us and he guides us and he directs us and he empowers us to live the life that you called us to live. And sometimes, Lord, as Christians, it can be easy to neglect the Spirit. He seems the most distant. And yet in reality, he is the one that is most present with us. In the sense that Christ said, I must go away. I must ascend to the Father. That way the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, may come and be with you and in you and among you. So Father in heaven, may we not just say we believed the gospel once, but may we daily, moment by moment, believe and be empowered by this gospel that we believe in and, and belief in the way that you've called us to believe, the way we've read about in the scriptures this morning. As we sing our belief in these truths to you, I pray that you'd meet with us now. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move among us. I pray that you, Heavenly Father, would be glorified. And I pray that all this would take place because of Christ, God the Son, who died in our place and made it all possible. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.